Um, my name is Deb Clement, and I direct public programs here at the Risky Museum. And what a delight uh, this afternoon to have Bo McCall here in conversation with Kate Urban, our curator of fashion and textiles. And to begin our time together, um, I want to honor the lands that we occupy with Risky's land acknowledgement, which I'll share now. Rhode Island School of Design is built on what is now called College Hill, part of the ancestral homelands of the Narragansett Indian tribe. Indigenous people from many tribes and nations near and far live, study, and work in Providence today. The amplification of Native voices and histories is crucial to rectifying the many violent legacies of colonialism, and we gratefully acknowledge the ongoing critical contributions of Indigenous people across our state, region, and nation. So you're in for a treat um, today, hearing from Bo about um, Bo's work and artistic practice, um, Kate will, uh, will guide us through the conversation and looking forward to having some thoughts and questions from you all. Uh, and we are going to um, kick it off and we're looking to end around three o'clock. So Kate, I'll pass it to you. Okay. Thanks everybody. So good to see you all here on uh, this, this, uh, this cloudy, icky day at the end, but, but you came to the right place because this is gonna be a conversation full of color and wonder and uh, just, I think, overall enthusiasm mm -hmm. and creativity for uh, Mr. Bo McCall and his, his work. Um, Bo and I and Soleo started talking, I think about, about three years ago exactly, um, and uh, this is when they were planning an exhibition, which I will, we, will, we will certainly talk about, um, and I will mention, um, but then we, we, I, I was not aware of, um, of your work um, until that time, and we had a number of conversations that ended up with um, the, the museum acquiring two pieces, one of which is the button vest, the caramel colored um, button vest, that's out on view. I think, I, hopefully everybody's had a chance to have a nice look at that. Um, and I'm sure that we'll have time afterwards to perhaps kind of filter out and kind of like talk with Bo maybe even in front of, um, of this uh, piece. So um, today I, I kind of see this as a, an extension, an expansion of some of the conversations that we've been having over the past few years as I've gotten to know you and your work and um, just had really kind of wonderful conversations. And we also, we have the treat of um, uh, some images that uh, Bo has brought along to um, really kind of tell the story of, of where you started and where you are now. Um, but I first just want to kind of just, just list a few of your kind of your bona fides in terms of kind of where um, where your work is you know where it started um, which is with kind of your your mother's buttons and we are going to certainly hear more about that um, and uh, and then it kind of moves into kind of your time um, in New York in the, the 1980s and 90s up until now but when you first started out um, and and uh, to, to kind of like t 2010, I think when you kind of like restarted, reignited um, your career after taking a little bit of a hiatus. Um, but we, you, despite uh, you just had, you have decades of work, and that is reflected in um, in the exhibitions um, that you have had. Uh, you've been a part of many exhibitions, um, including at the museum at FIT, um, at Nordstrom, at the African American Museum in Philadelphia, the Houston Museum of African American Culture, the Charles Wright Museum of African American History, and um, among others. And then of course we have Buttons On, Bo McCall Buttons On, that is opening at the Fuller Craft Museum on March 30th. So that's not too far away. I think I imagine that everybody is going to be running to that opening. And if for some reason you can't catch it there or you want to see it again, there are this the show will be traveling um, first to the Museum of Craft and Design in San Francisco, um, and then we'll come back 
to the East Coast um, to the Mattatuck Museum that's in Waterbury, Connecticut. Um, and then I think that there's even plans of, um, more, of more, more. more, 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 more. <laughs> so yes, so I think that it, we're, it's going to be around for a long time. I hope so. Yeah. Yeah, um, and then of course, in addition to um, being in the permanent collection now at the RISD Museum, your work is in the permanent collection um, at the Museum of Arts and Design in New York, at the Philadelphia Museum, at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, the Museum at FIT, the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, the Amistad Research Center in New Orleans, um, and the Museum of Modern Art Library, again, among, among many others. And, and I'm sure that that will be a growing list as well. So um, I think this is the first of, of um, many conversations this year. Yes, this is the very first um, one. But such a treat to, to have you here um, and to kind of get to, to spend this really, this, this quality time with you and to kind of just go walk through your career. Mm -hmm. So let's start the journey. Yes, let's start. <laughs> Thank you. So for those of you who are not familiar with me, I'm Bo McCall. I'm originally from Philadelphia. Um, as a kid, I knew that I was born creative. I couldn't dribble basketball. I couldn't catch a football. I have two other brothers. They were very athletic. Um, the first thing I can remember off the top of my head is doing something creative. My mom had a pair of T-strap sandals, and I said to her one day, I want these. And she said to me, oh, these are for girls. You can't have these. So every summer, we used to get a pair, um, a fresh pair of um, kegs, right? They were either going to be red or blue. So we got the blue pair that year. And I got my old kegs, and I cut the top of the kegs off, I ripped the padding out. And this was during the time that the telephone man used to come to your house and leave all the wires and stuff. So I macrame and did my little weaving and made all the straps. And I finished and I went back to my mom. I said, Mom, these are boy sandals. <laughs> <laughs> so that is my earliest memory of being creative. I've done many things as a kid. Every couple months, I would change. It would be macrame. It will be paper mache, we'll be making these little crepe paper flowers. Mom, I want so-and-so and so. So she just would just get the supplies and just let me go to town, right? So as I got older, um, in the house, we used to iron in the basement. I'm ironing, and it was this jar of buttons that was sitting on the, the steps. I saw the buttons, but I really didn't pay any, pay any, any attention. And then one day, he, the buttons was like having this conversation with me, like, open me. You, you need to check me out. You need to see what's going on in here, right? So I played with him for a while and put it back. And I found this um, knit sweater. Now I said, I'm going to take the buttons and I'm going to embellish this sweater. So it took me about six months to do the sweater. And I went to, out to a club when I got finished, and everybody was all over my sweater. So I wanted my, so I got to make another one. <laughs> so I made another one and I moved to New York. And I moved to New York with the intention of doing something creative. Now, what that was gonna be, I had no idea. Uh, for a minute, um, I was influenced by punk rock. So I had a punk band. <laughs> um, I tried that out. Um, I wasn't the best singer, but you know, you're young, you just experiment and do all kinds of things. So I went through that phase. Um, can I interrupt? Do we want to show some photos? Oh, yeah. Come on. As yeah, 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 yeah. Should we jump right, right. in? Let's go. This might, okay. So, this is my parents. These are the people who made me. These are the people who are responsible for me being here. So, that's my mom. This is one of my favorite pictures of my mom because I love her Marcel waves and her hair. And that's my dad. He's not smiling, but we all have dimples. But mine's are better than my siblings. And that's my mom's little ugly baby right here. Um, so I'm the firstborn, and my mom tells me all the time, I wanted a boy, I wanted you, I wanted you, I wanted you. I'm like, yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> so this kind of started it all. Um, coming up, they were very meticulous and detailed about the way they carried yourself, the way they dressed. Even if they was going to the corner store, my parents looked like they was going somewhere. 
So I got a little bit of that as, as far as style, but I created my own style from what they presented to me. So right here, they're probably, um, I think my dad is 20 and my mom is like 18. Do you want me to drive or to drive? This is me in Catholic school for elementary school. So if any of you guys went to Catholic school, you know it could be traumatizing. <laughs> so we all know about the, um, the rollers and the knuckles and standing in the corner. This was a very um, traumatic experience for me because I was very shy and I was very sheltered. And the least little thing that you said to me, I would just start crying. You could have said, I, I don't like your shoes, I don't like your haircut. I would be crying somewhere. So they had a lot to do with it. <laughs> they had a lot to do with that because I had no self-esteem at all. And then, you know, I had two younger brothers and it just seemed like they got some something in their gene that I didn't get. And I had to gradually try to figure out how I was gonna work my way out of all that security, insecurity that they laid on me. Next one. Now this is the importance of after school programs and day camps. So I grew up in public housing. And during that time, um, we had a lot of after school programs, we had a lot of day trips, we had a like overnight camp. And this is um, a day trip that we went to the Franklin Institute. So I got hooked on going to museums as a kid. Because every other week or a couple times a month, they would take us to a museum, and I was really fascinated by what I saw, not knowing, you know, one day I was going to be in the museum. So that's me, the chip went on the end. <laughs> and, um, a couple of these guys I still uh, remember, and then there was Scott, that was our counselor. So this kind of started it all with the creativity and I mean, being exposed to different types of art. Next. Um, this is when I got in high school. This is my art teacher, Ms. Jones. And Ms. Jones, for us, she was like Mary Tyler Moore. Like, when she would come to school, she would be stacked out, and we would be waiting for her to throw her head up in the air. <laughs> um, I was in this uh, business class with Mr. Howard, and everybody in the class got a job, right? And depending on where you were and the connections he had and um, what kind of student you were, um, we was having this conversation one day, and some, at doing this time, you know, I'm old, I'm old man, I think I was making like $1.35 an hour, right? And he said to us, whatever you make, that's what you're worth. I was so insulted. <laughs> so right after in the class, I went to Miss Jones's class, and I told her what Mr. Hawk said to us. And I told her that I was a creative, and you know, I could do this, I wasn't good with a paintbrush, you drawing, whatever. She's like, what do you do? I said, I'm more of a craft person. So the whole entire class is doing drawings and paints and stuff, and I was sitting on this side, hooking a, a rug with a scrim and all that kind of stuff. So I'm like, what she gets me, right? So she took me to um, like a surplus place that was a part of the public school system, and I went and got all these supplies and uh, to, to make this piece that I made. And during this time, Gimbel's department store they had a citywide um, art exhibit. And she thought enough that my piece was good enough to, to enter in this contest. And I came in third place. <laughs> so that's me on the end, and that's my rug sculpture um, that I'm holding. So, I, you know, again. I wish we had that. Yeah, it's, it's in my mom's basement somewhere. She, she can't find it. No, she said, it's, a, it's in here somewhere. I don't know where it is. So I went home during the holidays. This is my third attempt. Not yet. One day, someday. It's yeah. going to turn up. Yeah. Next. So, okay, getting back to this jar of buttons. This is how the journey started. I'm sure everybody in here has a jar, the cigar box, the cookie can tan, tin can. So it was either your mom your grandmother, your great-grandmother, your auntie, somebody had a jar of buttons somewhere. So I just really took this jar for granted, not knowing where it was going to lead me. So, you know, just like I said before, I played around with the buttons and, you know, I did these sweaters and I moved to New York. When I moved to New York, things started to change. So this is the very first sweater that I did. I had no idea what I was doing. 
I just said, I'm going to embellish this letter and I'm going to use as many buttons as I can. So I used all the buttons up. Um, when I started with the piece, um, I didn't take in consideration the weight of the buttons. So when I, <laughs> when I first bought it, this sweater, it was here. So when I started wearing it out to the clubs and dancing, it was down here. It was a sweater dress. Yeah, so it was like a little tunic after that. <laughs> then I made a sleeveless version, and I packed my stuff up, and I moved to New York. Now, are we going to get to see this in the... Oh, yeah, this is going to be it. Because this is the very first piece that I did with buttons. Oh, oh and then my sister wore that. I wore it. My neighbor wore it. It's, it's, many people wore this sweater. It's like, I'm going somewhere tonight. Can I borrow your sweater? Can I borrow your sweater? <laughs> this is Lois Alexander. She's the founder of um, HIF, which is the Black Fashion Institute, and the Black Fashion Museum. So I went, Harlem used to have this big festival, River to River, in the summertime called Harlem Week. So I go with a friend and I see this fashion show. So in the fashion show, this was the first time I saw all black models, all black designers, and then later on I found out it was black administrators and it was a black founder. So a friend of mine called me and said, are you still working on the jackets, the buttons that you're doing? So I'm, yeah. So what they're doing auditions, you should take your stuff around. So I took my stuff around. It was a guy, uh, George Saunders, young fella to me, super jack. So I started pulling this stuff out. We like it, we like it. When can you start? I said, well, as soon as possible. So I started that weekend, and that weekend turned into eight or nine years with all their events, all their shows. And then this is when I finally found my creative tribe. Because before then, I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't know whether I was going to be a singer, definitely wasn't going to be a dancer. Um, but it was many things that I could do creatively, but the buttons, they just stuck. So I'm stuck with the buttons to this day. And this is, these um, uh, chains that I'm wearing here, the, those are Mother of Pearl, and those are the first attempt at making these. So these will be in the retrospective too. So those are, I think those are maybe 30 years old. Is this a good time to um, to talk a little bit about your mother and uh, the influence of her? Okay, so <laughs> um, being an artist, and you know, people like to compare you to other artists. So I think we're all familiar with Patrick Kelly, the African American designer who works with buttons. Um, he's more than a button artist. He considers himself a fashion designer, which I do not. I consider myself a creative artist. Artist, you know, I go wearable art, visual art. When I get bored, I just go back and forth, back and forth, and whatever suits my mood, that's what I jump into. Um, my biggest inspiration is my mom. Like, if I go home now, my mom will have a jar of buttons waiting for me. <laughs> or if I'm leaving, she'll call my sister and say, did he get the buttons? Did you get the buttons downstairs? They're behind the door. Da, da, da. I'm like, Mom, I'm in the bag, whatever. So she still collects buttons for me to this day. Um, I'll just tell this lady right here. Um, my mom is 82, and when she goes out, she loves uh, thrift shopping and flea market. She was doing that before it was a thing. So she uses her senior privilege now. She goes in and she says, you guys have any buttons? And they said, well, Miss McCall, what are you doing with the buttons? She said, I'm taking them to the center. She never said, I'm taking them to my son. <laughs> <laughs> so she is, um, how can I explain this? Like she supported everything I did, even like with, with, with the sneakers. Yeah. She realized that it was something there. Just go ahead and just, just do it. If you need some supplies or whatever it is, is that you need, if I can get it, I'll get it for you. And she's like that up until this day. Um, it's gotten to the point where in, sometimes I have to hang the phone up on her because I don't want my work to be her work. And she'll like, you should do this. What are you gonna do a quilt? What are you gonna do this? What are you gonna do? I'm like, mom, I don't, that's not what I wanna do. I'm working on this right now. 
Did you try such and such a college scheme? <laughs> you know, like, you know, like a typical mom, but I love my mom, my mom loves me. But the basis of everything that I do, she's in there. She lives and breathes in everything that I've done, created. Yeah. A lot of times I get emotional, this is my mom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's right, yeah, I thought this would be a good, you're, a bit, you're about to like get to the point of you embarking on mm -hmm. kind of like really establishing yourself mm -hmm. in New York, but yeah, I think it's nice to know that you know, it was your mother carrying you there, really, and, and with you, you know, she got you to this point, as well as, you know, obviously yeah. your Yeah, because the last time I talked to her, um, you know, I told her about all the latest projects, and then so the last, I was on for holidays, and she was sitting in the chair. She said, "Are you making any money yet?" <laughs> <laughs> like you've been telling me the same story for years. <laughs> I'm like, "Yeah, mom, it's, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming." Because since you know, I've been in, uh, a, a fish, an official artist. She says. I want a condo facing the Hudson. The Hudson. <laughs> I'm like, we we gonna get there, man. We're gonna get there. Okay. So yeah. All right. So so we're we're moving out. We're moving on. Okay. Okay. So this is the sweater that's out here. So this is a, one of the Harlem Fashion Week fashion shows. Um, that's me looking real cute right here. Um, those are my Patrick Kelly glasses. Those are very cool. Um. That was the vest. Uh, my mom got me this vest from, you know, her thrifting and all this kind of stuff. Oh, I found a vest. This is not any vest. It has a slit up the back. You might like it. Come come get it when you come home. Then these sleeves right here, I do this technique called stacking, where I stack about 10 or 12 buttons on top of each other. So one day I'm working and I got stuck. I called my mom. I'm like, Mom, I'm working on this jacket. You know, I'm, I'm kind of stumped right now. She said, why don't you just stack some buttons on top of each other? I hung up and I stacked the buttons. I'm going like this. So my mom was responsible for that technique that I called stack. She really is with you. Yes. All the time. Yeah, she's here. Um, and then the, the, um, the majority of buttons is on this piece out here, and especially the, the gold trim, those are from her. And those are on uh, this red hat and this, this gold hat. Um, so this, this, these fashion shows, it will be between 30 and 50 designers. So when I first started, I was a little intimidated because everybody was making stuff from scratch. And during the time that I was doing stuff, upcycling had not been a thing. It had not came in fashion, okay? So the whispers used to be, So, you know, as I started um, to progress and, you know, just still um, develop different techniques, it's more than just sewing a button. You know, it's color combination, it's where the buttons are placed, it's what types of buttons I'm using, it's the sound of buttons. So it took me in a whole nother direction. And out of all these uh, 30 other, 50 to 30 other artists that was in the room, the guy who just sewed buttons got a two-page spread in Women's Wear Dead, yeah. just sewing buttons. Yeah. So from there, I sort of, you know, I got my strength up, like, you know, I can do this. And I'm not just sewing buttons. This is an art form. So I got my confidence level went up. And the only thing that didn't happen, they didn't tell me, um, when the piece was running, so I never got an actual copy of it. Oh, <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, what year was that? 92. 92. 92 was a big year for me, we'll, we'll talk about it. Mm -hmm. Next. Okay, so this is, like I said, all, the 90% of these buttons here my mom gave me. So in this piece, this is when I started exper experimenting with color blocking. So how I describe my general technique is, it's two layers of buttons. The bottom layer, usually the buttons are all the same color, or they're all uniform, they're the same size button, right? And then the buttons that's on top, those are the buttons that help me tell the story. Depending on what the piece is, it'll depend on what type of buttons that I select 
to speak within the piece for me. Now this is just faction, so I'm not really talking about anything here. But if you can see, it's a green section, there's a blue section, there's a yellow section, there's a red section. So I was trying to figure out how to do color blocking with just simple little button. And I figured it out. So next, I go to the next thing. And then um, these buttons, these gold buttons, they were like little pills. And sometimes I get bags of buttons and I don't want to use the buttons because I'm like, oh my God, I love these. Like, I'm not gonna waste it on this. <laughs> so I put them to the side until I feel like it's something worthy of this particular button. And then I'll use it like those. My mom gave me a, a huge bag of, of these buttons. And then with these bags, the best bags are the dirty bags that you don't know where they've been sitting at for God knows how long. And you open the bag and there's this is like scent in there that's more of an odor than a scent. Yeah. <laughs> but they all have the best buttons in those bags. So you know, I rinse them off and I clean them up and go to town. Can we talk about mm. your move from the, the sweaters, right, which the, which ended up, you know, kind of sagging down mm. with the weight of the buttons to the denim? I mean, you said that you were, your mother was, you know, sourcing some of that to mm. you, but I think there's there's some more to this the choice. The, right? the choice in fabrics. Um, with denim, we know that we use denim, denim as a fashion component. But years ago, before it became that, the slaves wore denim, and they called um, denim slave clothes. So the fabric can endure, you can beat it up, you can roll around on the floor, you can get dirty, it's very, very durable, and it's very flexible. So the very first jacket I did, it was denim. And then the denim could sustain the weight, and I could do more of a presentation with how I was clustering the buttons together. You must stand up for me. <laughs> so generally, I use Levi's denim. Um, Levi's, American classic, and, and I like, you call me crazy, but just, I like the little red tag that's right here that says Levi's. That's, that does something to me. <laughs> yeah. So here, when you have a partner and you have a forever friend and you're making stuff, they're like, you gotta make me one, you gotta make me, you're making everybody else stuff, you're doing stuff for this show, and then when do I get mine? So this is the first piece that I did for him. So, you know, I dig through my buttons and my buttons are sorted out by color and material. So there's blue, green, red, whatever. Then there's leather buttons, there's glass buttons, there's plastic buttons, there's another pearl button. No, just <laughs> let, let it sparkle. <laughs> and then I had little, like little mirrored buttons. So, you know, when I got finished, he was satisfied. You may sit down. After you do a twirl. <laughs> <laughs> and then moving forward, it's color combinations. Because a lot of times, I have to be creative with what's before me. Because, I, again, I don't know what I'm going to find. So when I separate these buttons and I make these color combinations, I want them to work. So I, you know, I think I did a good job of making that work here. <laughs> and then the, um, with the jackets, I utilize all of the jacket. So when we move forward, sometimes I cut the jacket away, um, the cuffs, I turn into bracelets. It just depends on what type of jacket it is. And it depends on what kind of mood I'm in when I'm working. So I'm a Pisces, so sometimes I'm all over the place. <laughs> so these are close-ups again. So again, you see this mustard yellow. If you see it again down here, you see this orange. And early on, when my mom would give me these bags of buttons, I would juice everything in the bag. I didn't save anything. I didn't like, oh, I'll save this for another project. I'll, oh, let me put this to the side. I used everything. And then I, I started moving forward. I'm like, I should have saved that. I should have saved this. This would have looked better with this. So I started being very selective on how I was utilizing buttons and what, I was, what projects I was utilizing the buttons for. So tell us 
tell me about that calorie shell there. Is that a button? No, that's an actual calorie shell. So sometimes I have calorie shell buttons. Um, I have them in, in metal, and then I have them in plastic in different colors. And then I also use clothing snaps. I think there's one in here where I use clothing snaps. And then I use um, uh, screws and nuts and bolts. If I can sew it down, then I'll use it. And then everything is hand sewn. Like glue is a bad word, word in my vocabulary as far as buttons are concerned. Because the thing with the glue is, it's messy if you make a mistake. Then I'm very good with the needle and thread. Now getting back to my mom, when I was a kid, my mom would be on the phone talking to her girlfriends and she would get a skirt or a pair of pants for my dad or whatever. She would thread the needle for me and she, she showed me three stitches. She said, well, just do this until you get finished. Do this until you get finished. And then when she would get off the phone, I would be finished. She said, see, I told you was gonna do a nice, neat job. Now here, do this one. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I got familiar with hands on. Yeah. yeah. Your mother keeps coming back. So this is what, what you call time lapse. Is that what you call it? Yeah. So sometimes when I'm working, yeah, I can be very guarded as far as my techniques are concerned. So this is why it's, it's like this. So my latest technique is in the green. I'm using the thread on the outside of the buttons as well as through the buttons and through the loop. Because a lot of times, like, these are just plain, this is a plain red button, plain black button. In order to make the button speak, I use the thread to bump it up a couple notches. So you can actually see that there are holes in the buttons, and you can actually make patterns with the thread. What kind of thread? That's the embroidery thread. The embroidery thread, I like, is stronger, it's six ply, and then, um, the pool of different colors that they have is amazing. Because they have um, glow in the dark thread, they have metallic thread, um, this little polished thread. Now all of them I don't like. The metallic is very hard to thread. This little polished um, cotton um, they have is very hard to thread. Just give me the cotton and we're good. Are you using a curved needle? It, I do, but on certain pieces. No, I'll, I'll get to that. So I'm using all different types of needles depending on what the piece is and depending on what the project is. Because usually I like working on flexible surfaces so I can manipulate the fabric. Now this, again, the base buttons are white. So another thing that I do with the thread is, is when I'm using the thread, and whatever the excess is, I don't throw it away. I just put it in a, in a bag and I save it, because I'm recycling, recycling my thread also. So this is what's happening here. All this thread is scrap thread. So in order to make this pop, I had to use all these different colored threads in between this button to bump it up a couple notches. Now here, this looks uh, very childlike because of the buttons that I select, selected. So we got pencils, we have school bus, we got lips, we got Christmas light, we have fly, hellos, color bone, the hearts, there's a, um, I think there's a penguin in there somewhere. So depending on what I'm using, they all take on a life and character of their own. So I can do this, the same thing in black and it'll be an entirely different piece. And I pride myself on the interior. Because the interior, this, this reminds me of spray paint. And it also reminds me of the little mazes that you take the pencil and you go through the little loops and all that stuff. That, and there's something else that I thought of the other day that I, I can't remember. Constellation. Yeah, Constellation. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so I love the inside, the interior, just as much as I love the buttons. Okay, this is another um, this is another commission piece from this guy right here. <laughs> so we go to a lot of events, and we don't like to just show up. We like to show up and show out. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 
So he said to me, well, have you ever thought about doing a button do rag? So most of the time I'm like, no, like what is it now? I'm like, I'm doing this. So, you know, we have conversations back and forth, back and forth. And then when I saw the vision, I was like, oh, you know, this is a great idea. So I had, again, my mom again, I had about six bags of clear buttons that I didn't know what to do with. And this was the first time I actually used um, the heavy cotton shirt material like this. So, yes, jam red. So it could sustain the weight. These buttons I had commissioned. So this is all about black hair care. Um, at one time, um, the black guys just wore these just to train your hair or our hair. But now it's become a fashion statement. So the buttons that I had commissioned, they're Afro combs, um, there's wave gel, there's wave spray, there's these um, sil silhouettes of um, black hair, black people with black hair. Then you have this guy right here with the do-rag on. And again, the spikes, my mom's technique. And this um, little webbing piece right here, I call this a webbing, where I work the thread on the outside of the button. This particular one, the thread glows in the dark. So they all have their own feature, their own character on how they're presented in the, in the, in the five final um, presentation. And this one is six feet. So yeah, you know, when you come in the room, everybody's going, like, oh my God, what is that? <laughs> or who is that? So I'm, I'm really, really proud of this. So I did three different versions of this. It's very heavy, but the price of beauty is painful. <laughs> <laughs> and one of them is- And the part of my collection here. here as well. Yes. Okay. That, will, that will be on view after the, the show, yes. the, the Fuller show, so that mm -hmm. was then traveling. So, so yeah. Um, and the, the buttons that you commissioned is Glaze Girl. Glaze Girl, she's on Etsy. Okay. So, so she's, yeah, she's on Etsy, so okay. Yes. Not in, in Yes. Because, you know, when you have a partner that can think for you, and I'm like, where am I going to find combs? Where am I going to find this? Where? Uh, here, go here. <laughs> Just draw it out on a piece of paper. She can do it. Yeah, I was curious where you're getting these buttons because um, I know you said you live in New York, so I was wondering where you're combing the garment district or where you. Well, well, let me address that too. Okay. And when I first came to New York, the garment district was plentiful. Right. right? I could go in the building if they ain't get on that, which is, it's more embellishments. The photo, you can't really see the um, the webbing on top of the yellow, because I used like an ombre thread, so you can see, go from light to dark, light to dark. But when you see it in person, you'll see that. So, uh, World Spinning on 45 relates to how music brings us all together, no matter where we come from, no matter what language we speak, no matter what color our skin is, Music just has the power to just lock us in together, right? And this is why I came up with the concept with this. So the buttons here, this is a perfect example of how the buttons help me tell the story. So I have musical notes, I have musical instruments, um, I have peace signs, I have anti-war signs, um, smiley faces, makes, makes us happy, hearts, he loves songs, so anything that relates to emotion, as far as music is concerned, those are the buttons that I selected for this piece. So that's the power of me keeping my mouth shut and letting the button speak for me. Because it's, I tell people all the time, it's probably billions and billions of buttons out the universe that I probably will never get my hands on. <laughs> but it keeps the, the, the uh, um, projects interesting because I never know what I'm going to find. I never know what I'm going to use. So this is one of my favorite pieces. So did you did you have these buttons that you found in your own collection, or did you get them? You had the idea, and then you went. You well, these, I sourced these out. A lot of these buttons are new, like with these yellow buttons. Um, again, with things um, drying up in the garment district, there used to be a place where you could take a bag of buttons and have them dyed whatever color you wanted. Too, right? So this was maybe the, the last thing that I gave them 
put them in a Ziploc bag. Um, they would have the, I call them Flintstone pots. They would have these huge giant pots and these giant spoons and you give them a swatch of what color you want. And they make the concoction up, they put the stuff in the bag, they stir it around, all in about 15 minutes. Wow. And you're, you're out of the place. So um, a lot of those places don't exist. So now it's like, um, I really, really have to be super creative because my color palette is very limited. And then I don't throw anything away. So it will get recycled in, a, in another piece. So another question I have is, um, so you, I, I, I hear that you're, you're listening to music all the time while you're mm -hmm. making. Mm -hmm. You talked about that, just how central the music is to your creative process. Um, so you, you can perhaps talk about that and tell us what you're listening to when you're making oh, this. Okay, now music, uh, the phone is very distracting. You know, it, it, there's a lot of times the phone is around, but with the phone, I, I can't, I can't concentrate. So I'll just rather hear music. And my first music is jazz. My parents, they only listen to jazz music. So in the house, that's all I heard was jazz. So if I wanted to hear teenage music, I would go to my neighbor's house where they would be playing Motown and Philly International, that type of thing. Um, here, it was a lot of jazz. Like, I love jazz. When all else fails, listen to jazz. Because when I started listening to my own music, my mother used to always say, well, what are they saying? What, what did they think? What did she just say? What, what are they saying? You can't understand the words. And then she would do the Dick Clark thing with like, I like the beat, but I don't know what they're saying. <laughs> you know, so again, my mom again. Now, this is um, on plexiglass. So I had it die cut on, on um, Plexiglass, and when I did the plexiglass, on as a matter of fact, the first one I did on plexiglass, the plexiglass is a little more fragile. So this is on um, plywood, so it's flexible; it can move. How big is it? Um, thirty by thirty. Sixty. Thirty-six, 36 by thirty. Yeah, yeah, it's huge. It's like this. And then again, with the, with the pieces telling the story within the story, it's very important that you see them in person because you can stand in front of one piece, maybe 10, 20 minutes, maybe longer than that, depending on how it you know appeals to you and how you, you engage with the piece. Because when I'm doing it, um, getting back to them, oh, he's just sewing buttons, and I'm not just sewing buttons. I'm working with spaces, and I'm trying to fill up all these spaces because the, the end result, I want it to look like a sheet of fabric, like a button sheet of fabric. So I don't want any spaces. I'm trying to fill up all these spaces. So certain buttons have to fit in certain spaces to cover those spaces up. And this is a, a close up. So you can, you can see the web in here. And then, um, this is the first time I did the webbing with the two hole buttons. The webbing works better with four holes because you got more options mm -hmm. to work outside of the button. But this this still uh, it came out pretty good. And um, a few of these buttons I got from um, uh, eBay, like the little piano thing here, um, the musical notes, and then these. Um, the, the, the uh, notes and the, the G clefs, I, and I know they're from Capital School, and I should, I should know more. <laughs> we were playing the instrument, we had music class. So some of the buttons had um, lullabies on them, um, different like um, songs and stuff that you could relate to with, within the, uh, the notes. And somebody brought to my attention that uh, smiley faces appear in a lot of my work. Uh, you know, I want to make everybody smile. I want to make you guys happy. <laughs> so, did you work on the fabric first and then wrapped it around? Okay, the yeah, this is addresses what you said. This, that was on. Um, the piece before, yeah. Yeah, that was on um, plywood. So, this is where I use the curved needle because I had to sew the fabric to the plywood. 
So you sew the buttons on the fabric and then the fabric on no, the No, the fabric fabrics. first. Okay. On the plywood, right? right? And it's not that much space in between the plywood and the fabric. So I couldn't use a regular needle. So I used a hook needle just to go underneath it. So, you know, I use various types of needles. It just depends on what it is. And this, it would seem like I could zip through it, but because of the needle, it takes a little, a little longer than it should. So we have about, we have about 10 more minutes. Okay. Um, Are you only I, taking questions afterwards? Or? We, I think we can take, we, yeah, maybe sure. we, should we take questions now? Or do you, okay. Is there? Yeah, yeah, let me just run through this real quick. Yeah. This is my dad. My dad was a boxer. He said he was 19 here. They called him the Phantom. And um, this, we had a fire one year. Um, I think my brother started the fire. It was in my parents' bedroom. And when my dad got home from work, he said to my mom, did you save my picture? Did you save my picture? And that's the, that's the picture. So that's my dad, he's an amateur boxer. And um, in the collage, I just started doing collages. So the collages are, are all existing works that I piece together and make collages out of. Okay, let's get to my mom. There's my mom. Um, my mom used to be very, very, very regal. Um, she wasn't overtly sexy, but she had her own kind of sex appeal. Mm -hmm. And then one of my aunts went to Africa. I, I might have been like nine or 10. And she came back and she cut all her hair off. So my mom would cut all her hair off. My dad had a fit, like, what? Did you have nothing else to do but go cut your hair off? What are you doing this for? <laughs> and she never grew her hair back. She just kept it natural. So that's why I use these black, um, black on black buttons to reference the, the coarseness in her hair. And this is one of, aside from the first picture, this is one of my favorite pictures of my mom. I love this picture of her. Is that, are we, uh, yeah, are we at the end yet? Yes. And <laughs> this is my unforgettable headshot. Because a lot of times you see headshot shots and they're not memorable. And I would figure if you saw me and you stick my tongue out with buttons on it, you will remember me. So the 13 is, we call this the family 13 because I'm born on March 13th. My cousin is born on March 13th. My mom and her sister are born on um, February 13th. And my dad is born on April 13th, and his brother is born on January 13th. So we call it the, the lucky 13th. So that's my lucky number. And then the green button is um, the Pisces symbol. And then back there, there's a Pierre Cardin button. And uh, the text on it. The text, oh, this is billions of something, I forget. And then that gold button is a Gucci button. So even when I separate the buttons, I have a value of designer buttons that I'm saving for what I don't know. <laughs> so yeah, so I want to thank you guys for coming out. I hope I engaged you, and I hope that you, some of you, can come to Fuller Craft for you know for my opening on uh, March 30th. Um, this is the first time I'm doing a retrospective, so this is a big deal. I've been at this for 40 plus years, and I really feel like now's my time. Yeah. Are you ready to <laughs> yeah, <no, I'm> talk? <laughs> you have wonderful stories. Um, and, and your history is wonderful. And your work is wonderful. And I, you can't only reach so many people. I know. Right? I'm thinking about it. Because, you know, um, I did a collage book of my deceased friends. And the sad part about this for me is that um, all my friends that I came out with, they're all dead. And we used to sit and joke and say, well, who's gonna be the last one to tell the story? Mm -hmm. So it was me and one of my friends, we were the last two sitting at the table. And he would drive from Philly, we would sit in my apartment, we would just get pissy drunk and say, who's gonna be here to listen to our stories? Who's gonna listen to our story? And it ended up me and me. So I take nothing for granted that I'm doing. I feel like that um, I was born blessed.
and I re can remember when I was younger, we used to hang around this older man, and I kept saying, why does he want to hang around us as old as he is, right? And out of all of us, he used to say, you're the blessed one. And I was like, well, why are you, why are you singling me out? But, to a, you know, he was right. I'm still here to tell the story. So a couple questions. Uh, how, do you remember how long it took you to do the 45 pieces? That's about three months. And also, um, do you only work on one piece at a time or? I like to focus, so it's one piece at a time. Uh, the, the part that I don't like about the work is all the work is by my, my hands. Because when I first started, I used to call my line by my own two hands. So there was no help. It was just me and my fingers. Um, the part that I don't like is prepping the work up. Because I have to outline everything and fill in these spaces. And then sometimes if I'm on a deadline, you know, just say with, with just say with my tongue, and I outline my tongue, right? And then I fill in the spaces. So I do one, two, three, four lines. So that's Monday. I have to finish that block in Monday, or I'm going to be off schedule. Mm -hmm. Then Tuesday I fill that block in. Wednesday I fill that block in. But I only do that if I'm running behind. Do you ever use a button as a fastener? <laughs> no. 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 For as many buttons that I come across, I never think of it as a fastener. But that's the one thing that we take for granted. That this little teeny little button that people know about all over the world, that we, we just take it for granted. You just get up in the morning and you fasten your clothes. And then, you know, we're in a, in a period now that. People don't even use buttons. So I just think they're precious. Okay. Is there one that, the one that went away, that got away, and you still think about, or a collection of buttons that you misplaced or lost, or? No. Um, no. Um, and even with, with the works, the works are like my children. Like, I don't have any children, but they're like my children. Um, you have to ask me on a particular day. It could be the, uh, the, the 45 one day, and then the next day it could be the tug or whatever. It just depends on. No, I mean the actual buttons. The ac actual buttons? Um, no. No. Because mm -mm. uh, they all have you think black people are still running around in the bush somewhere. And we went to an art conference, and. Um, we have a little, little Senegal, which is a couple blocks from where we live at. And most of those Africans that live in that community, they're mature folks. So you just see them, how they present themselves in a mature way in, in some of their traditional garbs. But you never see the young kids and how they're influenced in being an, an African in America and how they see themselves in America. I haven't seen it. So when we went over there, the creativity was like ungodly. Like I'm like, oh my god! Like some of the fashions I would look at the traditional stuff, and then my hair would say, but they took this off and put this there, and this is remixing people's traditional garments, not knowing what they mean. And I was blown away from some of the stuff that I saw. So when I came back, I created that. So that's that's not was that Motherland one, right? Two. two. So two I did for myself because I'm my best model, aside from them. <laughs> it's a great <laughs> Thank you. One more. I saw a photo of you where you were sitting at a, a counter sewing, and there was a, a bunch of buttons in like, drawers behind you. That's Is that your student? No, that's Lulu Buttons. Oh, it's fascinating. He, he has a button shop, and I was on um, New York One a TV spot uh, last month. And I didn't have a place to shoot the, um, the scene. So I called Roz and you know he, he let me shoot, shoot the segment there. And anything that I want, I, his wife hadn't met me. And usually when I go source the buttons, I would take pictures for reference. Because sometimes I forget where I saw him at. So I take pictures. So I'm in his shop and I'm taking pictures. He wasn't there this particular day. She said, honey, you cannot take pictures. 
We do not allow pictures. Do not take pictures. No pictures. I'm looking at like, I haven't come in here for years. Ryan's always letting me take pictures. So I said, okay, you know, let me not be an asshole. And I left. So a couple days later, I came back and she was there again and Ryan was there. She said, this is the guy I was telling you about. <laughs> he said, that's Bo. Let him do whatever he wants to do. <laughs> so, you know, 